coming up next. An encore interview with WAMC's Alan Shartalk in conversation with the late award-winning director and producer Arthur Penn. It's next. This is the story, this is the song of a left-handed boy who never meant wrong. He is dangerous and devilish, gentle and wild. Look on him tenderly, speak of him gently. He is death's child. Hi, this is Alan Shartok, and today, do we ever have a special treat for you? Joining us in the studio is the acclaimed movie director, Arthur Penn. Most of you will know Arthur Penn through his legacy of films like Alice's Restaurant, Little Big Man, Night Moves, and the pivotal masterwork, Bonnie and Clyde. While these films alone amount to an amazing career, they represent only a fraction of Arthur Penn's life and work through the years. We'll be talking with Arthur Penn about all of this and hopefully revealing some things about him that you don't know. But first, let me thank you for coming all the way over here from the Berkshires, Arthur, and for being with us, Arthur Penn. It's a great pleasure to be here. Arthur, I've listened to your show very often, and it's it's always wonderfully done. Arthur, let's start at the beginning. When were you born? I was born in Philadelphia. My parents divorced early on in uh, my childhood. Uh, I went to live with my mother and brother. Where? In... Uh, New Jersey briefly, and then into New York City, into mm-hmm. New York, in the Bronx, and in the Brooklyn, and we kept moving, and uh, because funds were non-existent mm-hmm. in those days. Was it depression time? Deep in the depression, yeah. Uh, and uh, how did your mother make a living? She did a sort of janitorial job at a hospital called the Good Samaritan, and then gradually worked her way up to being the assistant to the director of the hospital. Wow! So there were brains in the family. Well, she was an extraordinarily gifted person. Did you keep in touch with your dad at all, or was that... No, they were. They, it was quite a bitter divorce. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I would occasionally see him, perhaps three yeah. or four times during yeah. my early childhood. And then at 14, she decided, quite wisely, I think, for me to go and live with him, with my brother, wow. who had already been there, my, my older brother. And what did he do? He's Irving Penn, the great photographer. Oh, of course. I had no idea. And what kind of an impression did that make on you, if you can go back in time, in terms of your future as a director? In other words, detail and laying out scenes and posing people. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Survival was, was the essence of it. And it was not a bad childhood. You know, it was on the streets of New York. You lived by your wits, you know. Where'd you go to high school? When I was sent back to live with my father at 14, I went to high school in Philadelphia, uh-huh. Olney High. Then came out of Olney, and not that shortly, but within a year, I uh, was in the Army in the war. Uh, and where'd you do that service? Europe. What was it like? Well, I was um, an infantryman. I didn't see flat-out serious infantry action. I did all the training and was separated at the last minute And I have no reason to know why it happened that I was taken out of this basic infantry company and brought to something which was called the 15th Army Headquarters, which didn't exist. It was a group of people, group of soldiers, officers, and we were stationed in the Ardennes Forest. Really? In the King's Hunting Lodge. And bang, that's when the Battle of the Bulge came, surrounded us. What do you remember of that? Oh, I remember quite a lot of it because... Were you literally scared to death? or I was. One of the few men in this group, because they were army specialists of a fairly high order, having come, most of them, I think, from the National Guard. It was a non-existent army. I think it was a paper phenomenon. I've never really read anything about this. But you don't know what they were doing there. Well, I I only know that when we escaped this hunting lodge, I was sent back with three other guys to get both a Spanish couple who were the housekeepers and take the remaining files that had been left behind inadvertently and bring them to Brussels. And years later, Peggy and I arrived in Brussels to be celebrated for the first time by the Belgian film critics, and we walked into this hotel where I had brought these people. What did you feel? Can you remember your emotion at the time? Well, she describes it as having seen me just go white and drop into a chair, and it was true. I, 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 
I suddenly had a flash of what it was like that day when we came in. Uh, weapons loaded, everything ready to go. And it was really the uh, G2 intelligence headquarters. Did you ever have to fight? I mean, literally get into no, a fight? No, I did not. And there you were in the middle of that? I was in the middle of it. I had set up machine guns to protect us. But the great good fortune that we experienced was that the Germans were on a dash to Antwerp. That was the real game plan, which was they would recapture Antwerp, be able to use that as a port, mm, sure. and, and swing right. back again through Belgium and into France and rever get behind the Allied forces. Sure. Fortunately, it was a terrible period of weather, and on Christmas morning, the sky cleared, and from all over Europe there were contrails of bombers coming in and the ground just shook as they blew all the fuel tanks and all the... You're lucky they didn't get you. Well, we were well enough away yes. by that point. But the sky blackened from, from this, and the German attack ground to a halt. You and know, then, Arthur, it, sorry for stepping on you, but it occurs to me that somewhere, you know, this whole sort of mystical experience of being assigned to a unit that really wasn't, and all the rest of it, might have been a great film somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should really go through some military histories and try to find references to the 15th Army headquarters. That is, that is. Because so there cool. was no army. Yeah. You know, it, so whether it was designed as some kind of ploy to deceive the Germans or what, I don't know. Do you find later in life that you still harbor some prejudice towards the Germans as a result of that experience? Well, I did certainly short after the war. It was very difficult for me. I couldn't go to Germany. Mm -hmm. I went with my family, my very young son at that point, eventually to Austria to ski, but it was still very difficult. Some people me. think they were worse. I know. <laughs> when 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 we would be we were on the train and and in came these customs officials wearing a uniform far too familiar. It was a pretty upsetting experience because I ended up the war in Germany. But what happened was there was a very there was very bitter fighting during the month of January. My old unit, which was the 106th Infantry Division, lost two-thirds of the yes. people. Huge. Huge loss. And that was, that was the bitter band of brothers, foxhole to foxhole fighting that took place until the air superiority of the Allies was mm -hmm. so firmly established that they were able to finally cut off supply lines to the soldiers and they greatly, there are great numbers of them surrendering. I remember them just, you know, walking terribly. And at that moment, I have to confess, I had a terrible sympathy for them because you for the see Germans. Them. Yeah, they of were. The Germans had done similar things and much worse to the Russians. Worse. Terrible. Yes, and much worse to the Americans. Yes. That of the two thirds of that old unit of mine, one third were prisoners. Mm. So then you, you lived we went, through the war. You lived yeah, through I was war. in Cologne and Duren and Aachen, and we ended up in a little town called Bad Neunar when the war ended. And then I got a pass, a three-day pass, to Paris. You don't remember the year, do you? Oh, this is right right after the fighting. This is between... Uh, 45-ish. 45, and yeah. the war with Japan was still on. So right. we were... The infantry people were still under heavy alert. And you thought you might have to go to Japan. Oh, yes. We were pretty sure we were going to go and that there was going to be a D-Day in Japan. I had this three-day pass. I was on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, and I ran into a guy that I had known at Fort Jackson when we were both in training. He was an ex-theatrical agent, and he said to me, First of all, we were very glad to see each other. You know, we sure. lived through it. Lived he through was it. in an armored division. I was in the infantry. He said, you know, they're starting this thing called the Soldier Show Company, which is they're going to do shows for the incoming kids of the Army of Occupation because they don't want them to fraternize with the Frauleins. Would you like to be in it? I said, anything, because it was going to be in Paris. It was headquartered in a little suburb called Chateau outside of Paris. Lo and behold, I went back to my unit and there were orders awaiting me to report to Paris. And so begins the legend of Arthur Patton. <laughs> well, I was, they taught me to be a stage manager. It was an extraordinary gathering of people because 
They gathered all the sort of actors and writers. Patty Chayefsky was there, Mickey Rooney, Bobby Breen, Billy Halep, who was the lead kid of the Dead End Kids. And it was a show with him, a company of Golden Boy, of Clifford Odets' play Golden Boy, with Billy Halep and Connie Dolly. And I was the stage manager. We did that and started touring. And the bug, you were bitten. I was bitten to a degree that I thought, well, I seem to feel competence in this area, and I think I know what I'm talking about, but it was at a, a rather secondary position to the director. So that went on, and then suddenly the war in Japan ended because of the atom bomb. Everybody who was there had points. They, mm. Suddenly Congress gave you points. If you were in combat, if you were in a war zone, if you had been there, etc., well, everybody in this group, of course, had those points, and they wanted to go home in a great rush. The army came to me and offered me a job as a civilian. I, I, they said, you go to Heidelberg, take your discharge today, come back, and you're an, a government employee in charge of this program. So I did it. In charge of this whole... The whole soldier show program in Europe. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now, somebody must have had, you must have had, as we say in the police field, a rabbi. You must have had somebody who was looking out for you. <laughs> well, you know, we, it proved that we were the most functional play that had been sent out on this I program. Okay. And having continued to function, they, they assigned a good deal of that credit to me, which was not exactly deserved. But I accepted it with pleasure. Hey, that's life. Went, went into Heidelberg, <laughs> came back a civilian, and had an office in the Wiesbaden Opera House. Oh, boy. Now, what's your religious background, Arthur? None. <laughs> you have, you just had none? None. My parents were Jewish, but yeah. they were old European socialists, you know. Who had... Well, I know that tradition very yeah, well. In very fact, well. I come from it myself. But the question then is, here you are in Germany after this terrible thing has happened. Even with, you know, just Jewish blood in you, did you feel any emotion about oh, yes. what had happened to all the Jews? Oh, oh, unquestionably, I did. The emotion was present, but it was I, I had an, a different experience. I was much more concerned with the contemporary politics of sure. that time. I remember in one town, which we took while the war was still on in Europe, a young woman, it was a, a store that sold ersatz fabrics, and she had come round the counter, and she said to me, and this was just on the eve of it, I'm glad President Roosevelt is dead. Mm. And without thinking, I just lifted her up and knocked her over Ooh. the counter. It exploded out of me with something that I had never anticipated, mm. you know. So it was that level that I was more concerned. As the information became more and more available, I became more engaged. And then, this is an extraordinary story, I went to the Nuremberg trial. Really? Yeah. For three days, I was permitted to sit there, and it was extraordinary. And you saw those guys in the I docket? I saw them in the docket, not 200 feet away. And they wow. said, there are very few people in the world who can say they saw that. Yes, it was amazing. Telford Taylor was the sure. prosecuting for the United States. They were engaged in the prosecution of Baldur von Schirach, who was the man in charge of Hitler Youth. But there sat Goering with the most profound disinterest. It was really bizarre. And Hess, and, you know, it was an experience that was not real for three days. Did you write about it? Did you? I didn't. I never never have written about it. But I had a long conversation recently with somebody who has then sent me a good deal of research from Telford Taylor that recounts this particular interrogation and prosecution of Von Schirach. Did you see Judgment in Nuremberg? Yes, oh yes. It was done originally on Playhouse 90, which is one of the places I ended up. Okay, let's not skip ahead because I don't want to miss any of this. All right. Okay, so you're in Germany. They give you the civilian job in theater, and what happens next? Well, it lasts a year, and I make the first money I've ever really made. I come back to the States. I have the GI Bill for four years. Mm. I think I don't want to go to a conventional university and become a freshman and do all sure. that. 
My brother, who was at that time already quite a distinguished photographer for Vogue, and in our early years, I remember books about the Bauhaus and the Bauhaus group. Well, a good number of those people from the Bauhaus got out of Germany, were admitted to the United States, but the academic institutions wouldn't recognize their credentials from abroad. So they settled in a place in Asheville, North Car- near Asheville, North Carolina, which was Black Mountain College. And Black Mountain College was a, <laughs> a peculiar, wonderful place. It had no accreditation. What they did, however, was it had started out, I believe, as something of a spiritual group of people who would live off the land and educate each other. So we had little of a little growing farm. But by the time I got there, I got on a bus and went down to North Carolina and got to Black Mountain College and spent a week there and said, this is for me. This is where I want to be. And at that time, Joseph Albers was there. Walter Gropius had been there. He was famous because he was married to Alma at one point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Walter Gropius had designed some buildings, one of which had been built, a studies building out in the lake. There was no money, but the GI Bill was the perfect instrument because we just turned over whatever we got each month to the school, and we all ate and lived on what we could raise or what we could purchase with that. But the population was exquisite. It was that explosive moment when these people were there, when Buckminster Fuller came, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, Alfred Kazin, you know, because of this peculiar xenophobia of the academic institutions, not realizing that this was an inheritance of enormous wealth. Eventually they did, and Gropius became Dean of Art and Architecture at Harvard. Albers was Dean in of Art and Architecture at Yale. You know, these people spread, and the science man Max Dane went to the Institute at Princeton with Einstein. But, but for this period, they were locked. And Bucky Fuller had just gone through a period of some difficulty with the uh, Dymaxion car, which, for no reason of design, had crashed, and it, he'd received a terrible press. And at this point, he was deeply depressed. And he was down there starting to build, out of Venetian blind slats, the first idea of the geodesic dome. And so it was an extraordinary place, and I started to study. I had not really been to school seriously. Even high school was not serious because we were in wartime, and I knew I was going, so I didn't pay that kind of attention. Also, my father was dying during that period, and it was a very difficult period, very difficult. So my attention was clearly not on academics. But I got to Black Mountain and had a wonderful series of experiences with people. Of course, one has to call them teachers, but teachers as well as companions. We lived together, we ate together, we talked. There were no classes as such. You were in a Socratic dialogue with the people that you were. They issued degrees? No, no. (laughs) They weren't accredited. So they, so they didn't even pretend. No, I mean, you didn't. Yeah. You got no grades. You got no degrees. You got nothing. You were simply there, and if you could live and stand the amount of freedom, which was not always mm. true, mm. it was pretty uh, difficult for some How long? people. Pardon? How long did you stay? I stayed two full years. The last part of that was John Cage decided to do a play of Eric Satie's called The Rus of Medusa, and Merce was going to do the staging, and they decided to have Bucky Fuller play the lead. Well, Bucky was paralyzed by that, just terrified. So they asked me, based on the very little bit of theatrical knowledge I had, to work with him. So we started, and the only thing I could figure out to do was to make as big a fool of myself as I possibly could and have him join me. So we'd get down on the floor and start rolling around and laughing and jumping, and pretty soon this this armor began to fall away from him, and he played it perfectly splendidly. Why did they want him to be the lead? Well, he was perfect for it. I mean, it was a very small population. At any given time, there were probably no more than 150 people 
faculty and students. But the beauty of this experience was, now we see Arthur Penn, the director, for the first time. For the first time. And then I thought, well, but th that's not really what I want to do. I, I think I want to be a writer. I think I want to be... I don't know. I was reading T.S. Eliot and thinking about Italy and Dante, and I thought... I've got two more years on the GI Bill. Why not I go to Italy? So I did. And the, the Army just had no problems with just putting out the money, right? Could go anywhere in the world. They, it was $75 a month plus a small book allowance and tuition. And you didn't need accreditation or anything like that? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It was a magnificent response to the war. And so I went. I went to Perugia first and learned the language, and then I went to Florence for a year and uh, read sort of Italian Renaissance poetry to the best of my ability, which was not very good. You know, you have to have grown in that language. It's like reading Beowulf. But nonetheless, it was a very pleasurable experience. More than anything, I discovered that I was more visually attracted to things than I was through the literature. So I started traveling to museums, to sites, to following painters, paintings, and, and you know, tracking down, oh, there's a Masaccio, which belongs in the Florence Museum, but it's been moved to Naples. So I'd get on a train or hitchhike down to Naples. So that was the, you know, one of those blissful years. And then? Then I came back, and I, now I needed a job. Mm -hmm. I was no longer a kid. I thought, I'll get to be a stage manager on Broadway, like that, you know. Sure. Of course, that didn't happen, but I did run into somebody who said, NBC is hiring floor managers. And a floor manager is a sort of equivalent to a small-time stage manager, except it's very simplistic. You stand off camera and you point to the person to go on the air and go off the air and speed it up if they're going too slowly or etc. Fortunately... I had this credential from the Army as having been head of this program. So when I showed that to NBC, I got hired like that. My first job was holding cue cards for Milton Berle, Ugh. <laughs> which went on for several days. Not all that pleasant, because whenever anything would go wrong, he would say, it's the cue cards. Like, hold, this, hold the cards. But it was, it was fascinating, and then very quickly... This is really the early days of television. It's 51, 50 and 51. Television is just beginning on certain shows to be profitable. Many shows were not profitable yet, and there weren't that many sets yet. They were in black and white, etc. And then they completed the coaxial cable across the country, and in a show that I had been assigned to as a floor manager was the Colgate Comedy Hour, wow. which was in New York. It was Martin and Lewis and, you know, Eddie Cantor and all those people. And they all wanted to be in California desperately. So along with Norman Lear and Ed Simmons, who were the writers for Martin and Lewis. So we all were transferred out there. And Bud Yorkin and I were sent out to sort of be the stage manager, floor managers of the show and train floor managers for bigger shows than they had been doing locally in well, naturally, if you had any sense in those days, you could move very fast. And very quickly, we both became what's called associate directors. It's the equivalent of an assistant director in movies, which meant moving into the control room. And then very quickly after that, the opportunity was offered to me by Jerry Lewis and by Eddie Cantor to be the director of the show the next season. How did that happen? It just doesn't, opportunity just doesn't happen. They must have known you. They must have had some sense of Oh, you. sure, they knew because I was with them through each week's rehearsal. Well, what was it like? It was a madhouse. It was a perfect madhouse. Each comic who would have then a week's rehearsal at the Hotel Roosevelt would, first of all, be very impatient with their writers because they had to come up with comedy skits. Mm. Then they would rehearse them. Then that was not the right thing to do. Then Jerry would say to Norman Lear and Ed Simmons, you, show me, you got to get up and do it, you know? And really? so Yeah, so they would have to get up. And I remember Norman and... And Jerry would say, no, 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 here, let me, and he would dive into the middle of it, showing Norman Lear how to do what Norman Lear had written for him. 
and it was an exquisite kind of behavior. It, it was, it was wild in many respects. Jerry, particularly, was. Uh, they were receiving sums of money that they had not ever dreamed of, and a freedom because NBC was living practically on this show. Uh, CBS was living on the Ed Sullivan show. And Martin Lewis, Jerry, was the real brains of that, yes or no? Well, he was the real brains of it in one respect, that at that time, the quality of their act was as a tumbler, you know? Yeah, yeah. There were no limits. He would break the line of cameras, go out into the audience. Well, all those things were sort of frowned on on all the other shows because television was trying to develop an orthodoxy of, of the suspension of disbelief, so you didn't violate the medium parameters. But actually, for my taste, the real brains was Dean. Mm. Dean Martin. He was the funniest man, first of all, on his feet that I have ever heard. Mm. Witty. We saw that much later. We saw that yes, later after. Much, Marla. much yeah. later. He was pretty badly hurt by that period of Jerry's dominance, and then they broke up. And it was, uh, Jerry was in ascendancy and Dean was sort of left behind as his Italian crooner, which was certainly not a description of him. He was was an extraordinary man. In any event, prior to, to ever getting to direct these shows, I got a call from New York from Fred Coe, who was the producer of the Philco Playhouse, which was the dominant drama show. Because I had floor managed briefly with one of the directors, Vincent Donahue, they were doing a new show called First Person that Fred had designed, which was an attempt to do the first person short stories of all the great writers, mm. Faulkner and Hemingway, etc. And so they were going to have this new program, and they'd asked Vincent to recommend somebody, and he kindly recommended me. So Fred called me and said, would you like to come to New York and try to be the director? I'm going to have two of you be the director of this show. And I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And that was the end of my comedy days until much later on Broadway. And so I came to New York, and there I, first show, first show, I was the director. It was Patty Chayefsky's script, Joe Anthony, Mildred Dunnock, and Kim Hunter. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. (laughs) And I simply said to Joe, I said, Joe, you're a director. I'm not. I I can't talk to Millie Dunnick and, you know, those people. So I'll call the cameras and you direct this. So that's how it started, really. And it was not that I didn't know more than I alleged I did, but I didn't dare express it yet because I had not found the language of the actors, particularly the New York in group. Of now, this is uh, Joe. Joseph Anthony, Joe. who was a big, big Broadway director at, shortly thereafter. But he was a member of the studio. They were all members of the actor's studio. And I didn't have the language, although while I was in California, I had studied with Michael Chekhov, who had formerly been at the Moscow Art Theater and was quite an extraordinary fellow. And that's how it happened. So then I started directing every other show. And with people of such extraordinary skill, Kim Stanley, you know, just that you'd have to be a fool not to learn from them because she'd say, say it to me in another way or do a little something of what you mean. Well, I was practically paralyzed in the presence of these people, but I was able to begin to make contact and find the language, the idiom of the language of actors. And that's... um, that was it. Then, was the there end- one of those that really stands out in your mind as being just so important? One of those shows that was you remember? Jim Stanley, yeah. Tears of My Sister, it was written by Horton Foote, and it was a one-person show in that sense. But visually, we were able to surround that person with images or objects that would generate recall in them that would bring them back into the prose of the original writer. All black and white, yes? Oh, yes. 
very black and white. <laughs> you know, this is prior to zoom lenses. Sure. So it was really each camera had a turret, you know, where if you wanted to get from this shot to another shot, you had to go to another camera on a different lens and then tell him to rack over to a different lens. So I was carrying the, the idea of the number of lenses on these cameras mm. in my head. How long did this go on? That went on the summer. At the end of the summer, Fred came to me and said, I'm going to make it three directors on Philco, and I want you to be with the third director, which was the dream. It was sure. a Sunday night drama with the greatest writers of that era. I remember it, by the way, very well. You do? Yes. Well, every Sunday night, it was uh, Delbert Mann, Vincent Donahue, and I. And we would finish a show Sunday night, get a day or two of rest, and then start the next one. And that was it. It was such a privilege to work with these actors because they were unimaginable to somebody who would want to learn. Were they kind to you? Enormously kind because... One, of course, kindness was based on relationship, of course. Respect. But also, we were all flying in these blacked-out airplanes, you know. We'd go up to 30,000 feet and not know where we were going. So anybody who seemed to have some kind of authority and, and clarity about how this would get on the air and get done and within the hour, and that's what we were, the directors were at the beginning. Arthur Penn, let me ask you this. These were all live, yes? Yes, absolutely. I think people have no idea about that. No. These were live, live drama on television. Live drama on television. Three cameras. Had to be timed. Had to be timed, had to come out at the hour, and we did the commercials in the same studio right there. We'd fade out the scene and come up on the refrigerator or whatever the Philco product was that they were featuring, fade that out and go back into the drama. Are there kinescopes of this? There are some very few kinescopes. Mm -hmm. What happened was that there was a jurisdictional battle between AFTRA, the mm -hmm. American Federation of Radio and Television and Actors, and SAG, mm -hmm. because kinescope is film, and the other live television was air, was radio in those days. And so the Saramaic solution was to get rid of the kinescopes. Oh, boy. After a certain period, they were retained for legal reasons and then destroyed by NBC. It's the kind of thing you just wish somebody had said, the hell with this, I'm putting this in my pocket. Well, Suskind, <laughs> David Suskind did some of that. <laughs> did he? he? He took some, and he, he eventually gave them to the museum in New York. But they were very few. Yeah. Okay, so let's keep so going. So here we go. Now, I do this for a couple of years. Color television is being developed by RCA, which owned NBC. And so it was decided to have a big show in color. And they decided to do State of the Union, Lindsay and Krauss play that had been a great success with Margaret Sullivan and Joseph Cotton. At that point, we were bleeding Hollywood people into what would have, had up to then been essentially a New York-based drama programs. So here I had these two Hollywood stars doing live television. But how did you get to be the director of this? Well, I was one of the top NBC directors by at that, that point. Gotcha. And so they said, Penn, you... You do this out at the Brooklyn studio, away from Radio City. You're such a self-effacing man. You're pig well, you're crossing I, over some of the important stuff. Well, it it was it was that period where people were doing the damnedest things so quickly, and every it was being thrown to us because we were the small population of directors, Frankenheimer, Lumet, Mulligan, uh, you know, Frank Schaffner. It was a very small population of maybe 15 or 20 guys who could do this. Extraordinary. Okay, let's go. So there we are. And all I remember of that experience beyond, beyond a couple of little sort of gossipy things was that I kept getting phone calls while we were setting up the shots from General Sarnoff in New York saying, get her a brighter dress. I want more color in the dress. I want more color. Really? And that was because he was selling color television. Yeah. And then at that point, Television sort of broke the economic line and became profitable, mm -hmm. really profitable. That's when the sponsors began to interfere with the qualities of the shows, the content of the shows, and it got very testy. Were you making money as a, a big money as a director? No, no. no. 
I was making 300 bucks a week. Well, not bad at that time. Right? Well, it was not bad, but, you know, these were big, yeah. big oh, yeah. shows. Okay. And it was more money than I'd ever dreamed of making, but that was it. And then CBS decided that it was really a, the future. So they built an entire unit out in California, Television City, and they asked Martin Manulis to become the producer of Playhouse 90, which was now going to be an hour and a half a week of live drama. I remember it very well. Now let's come back to the Berkshires. My very good friend, dearest friend, Bill Gibson. We had met years before when I was at Black Mountain. We would sort of exchanged writings, and then when I was in Italy, I wrote letters, and we wrote letters back and forth. And I would stop at the Gibsons when I would want to go up skiing, and eventually Peggy and I were married at their house. Yeah. Bill had written a very good play called A Cry of Players, which was done later. Their house, by the way, was in Stockbridge. I think yes. we should say that. that people. Yes, okay. that's right. So he'd written A Cry of Players. Now he was in the midst of writing a new play. He read us the first act, and I was just bowled over by it. And then he said, but I don't have the money. i got to get some money. I said, well, essentially, let's figure out somehow where you could write something that I could sell to television. He said, well, once I did a dance narrative about Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller. I mm. said, oh, really? You're going to make us all cry. Go ahead. <laughs> That's it. He sat down, and we ske he sketched it out. And I said, I'll get you 500 bucks for this. You know, there's just no doubt about it. I took it to NBC, and they turned it down. I said, you're insane. This is wonderful. I took it to CBS, and they turned it down. But Martin Manulis, now having just started, been given the assignment of producing an hour and a half a week of live television, came to New York, got in touch with his group of directors and said, give me material, please, I am desperate, etc. I said, okay. And he said, how many shows can you do for me? And I said, I can do four because I've already got my first contract to do a film with Fred Coe. So I'll do four live. And he said, okay, what have you got? And I gave him the miracle order. All right. Pump. No, she's not here, Pump. W-A-T-E-R, water. It has a name. W-A-T. California and came a response saying $10,000 on the way uh. to Bill. And we did The Miracle Worker on television live. live before Broadway and before the film with Teresa Wright playing the lead really? with Patty McCormick, Akim Tamirov, but it was live. And from where we had been you know, using only three cameras in the East. Here we were in this new studio with magnificent equipment using five and six cameras. And it was a gigantic event. And Miracle Worker was an enormous success as a live television show. And there's no kinescope of that either? Yeah, there is. There is. Okay. There is. But then there was this huge response from people around the country. At that point, I then did my other three shows, and I went off and went to Warner Brothers to do my first movie with Fred from a script by Gore Vidal with Paul Newman. Come here. Mr. Tunstall! Put down your gun. Put down your hands. Do you belong to Mr. Morton? Are you one of Morton's men? What's your name? Say your name, boy. 
name's William Barney. Says he wants work. He's with us till he shows he's against us. Tom will take you to the men, give you a canteen, and assign you to a quarter boss. Now, see that he gets the blue mare, Tom. Yes, sir. We'll make camp here. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, this here is, uh, what you call yourself? William Barney. William Barney. This is Charlie Beaudry, and I'm Thomas Ballard. Yo, William. We'd best call you Billy for short. The script was later rewritten, essentially, by Leslie Stevens and me, but we had Paul, and we made a film called Left-Handed Gun, <laughs> which was a, a Western. It did nothing in the United States. It was dismissed by all the critics as being too arty and not Western enough. But there were critics who liked it, weren't there? There were critics in Europe. Yeah. Andre Bazin wrote yeah. about the poetry of this, etc. But But that was all a year and a half later. And when I finished shooting that film, a guy came up to me and said, hello, I'm former Blank State. I'm the best editor in Hollywood. I'm going to edit your movie. And I, I said, what? Because it seemed to me impossible. I was editing my shows As on the air. Yeah. How could you come in and edit what I shot? But that was Warner's way. And the next thing I knew, my parking space was gone, and I was off Warner's lot. So I came back to New York thinking, this is not the medium for me. I have no interest in it. Bill, in the meantime, with that money, finished Two for the Seesaw Ugh. and read it to us, to Peggy and me, and I just was knocked out by it. Just thought it was wonderful. And so, lo and behold, he attempted... His agent attempted to sell it to Broadway producers. No response. No response. Nobody liked it. I said, I know the guy to, that will produce this. I took it to Fred Coe. Fred took it over the weekend to Bucks County, came back and said, we're doing it. And that was it. If he gave him $10,000 for the first TV show, what did he give him for that? Well, well he, didn't, he okay. didn't have to buy it. What okay. he did was he took an option on it, and he raised the money. And what he did was he sent a script to Henry Fonda, who was in the south of France, and Fonda was the biggest star on Broadway. And back came a telegram from Fonda saying, I'm yours. Well, with that, he could raise anything you want. You know, there was sure. no limit. And that was our, our big task. Now was the task to find a girl, a girl to play the part. We tried every which way, not with a great deal of success, but I had worked with this girl on one of the Playhouse 90s, and then somebody told us about her again, Dick Basehart, I think, Richard Basehart, mm -hmm. said, this is girl, Anne Bancroft, you ought to see her, and she came in, and bang, that was it. She had not really been on the stage in her life. She trained a little bit at the American Academy of Dramatic Art, so there she was, a first-timer with Henry Fonda, you know, who was, I don't know, Hank Aaron, you know, of Broadway. We, Let me get this straight. This was on Broadway. Broadway. Yeah. Broadway. So we were out of town with that show, two people, and Bill said to me, you know, I think I'm going to write The Miracle Worker as a play for Annie. And I said, oh, Bill, you're out of your mind. Let's get this one on. We were working day and night, and my first child was being born. You know, it was just a terrible, pressured period. So you and he really have been lifelong partners. Long, long friends. We opened Two for the Seesaw. My son is born. We opened Two for the Seesaw, and it's a big hit, and Anne Bancroft is a star overnight. And then a short period later, I get the script from Bill. And it's the script of The Miracle Worker. This guy really knows how to work, Bill Gibson. He knows how to work. He's a superb dramatist. He has a skill with dramatic material that I think is really virtually unparalleled in American writing. There we were. We were sitting on top of the world. Well, at this point, may I just boast for a while, what happened was I did Seesaw, I did The Miracle Worker, I did Lillian Hellman's Toys in the Attic, Tad Moselle's All the Way Home, and An Evening with Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Yeah. Right in a row. Bang, 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 bang. And all on Broadway. And all on Broadway. And f four of them at one time were, four or five of them were running simultaneously. Wow. It was a really high. Can you just end. tell me a little bit about what it's like to direct. I think those of us who are sitting out there have no idea really what a director does when he gets there. You say, do this, do that, 
what exactly do you do? What you do is you realize about 110 pages of words that are put down as to be spoken. And that's the text. But as Harold Kerman would say, that's a text. It's not a play until the actors do it. And in point of fact, it is that marriage of getting the actors to not just speak these words, but really live the circumstances out of which these words emerge so that you encapsulate the text with human behavior, human circumstances, and an environment that permits us, when we sit in the theater then, to deeply believe what we're... But how do you do it? I mean, in other words, you say, stand this way, look this way. No. I mean, what do you do? It's more mystical than that. In a, in a sense, it's giving confidence to an actor to treat these words not in the very conventional way that they might be spoken, but to personalize out of his or her life something that was equivalent to this kind of emotional experience. And lo and behold, what happens then is that the material begins to live in a way that is the conjunction of the actor and the text. And it's a difficult process because until it happens, it's painful and filled with gloom. And Lillian Hellman, when we were doing Toys in the Attic, I had Jason Robarts, Maureen Stapleton, mm -hmm. uh, Irene Wirth, Anne Revere, you know, a wonderful cast. But Lillian never understood theater process. Mm -hmm. And she sat at those first rehearsals, and every time one of those lines would come out, she'd go, <coughs> this painful cough. And finally I said, Lillian, look, go home, and then come back in four or five days and if you don't like what we're doing, fire us all and start all over again. Did she have that right? Yes. Really? The right belongs to the playwright in theater. Uh -huh. And they have the absolute right. But the most important person in all of it is still the director, isn't it? No. No, the most important person is the drama. Really? Uh, yeah. The director is very important, particularly if they have a comprehension and the trust of the playwright that what will happen is that out of this mixture of panic-ridden actors and dry text, a life is going to emerge, you know? But that takes a lot of faith on the part of the playwright. So is that true that the playwright is as important, I think the answer to this is going to be no, in film as it is on Broadway? Not at all. No, it's just the reverse. In yeah. film, it is the director. It's always the director because film is so non-dependent on the spoken word. One can generalize that. That, yes, the, the content of the dialogue is very important. Yes, the description of the actions are important. But how they are realized is really what makes the difference. And that realization of the material is the director's. And there are a lot of people in film, writers, who tell stories about how they walk away, they don't want their, their name on it, or they don't want, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. Yes. But I, I've always enjoyed a very good relationship with, with all the writers except Gore Vidal. But then, you know, I've invited them always to be present, to be part of it. Oh, but by the time they have written it, and then it's gone into production, and now it's being made and being put together, they have gone on to another project for the most part, you know, because a film takes a year and a half mm -hmm. at least. Now, some directors are mean, and some directors are nice, and some directors, you know, have different qualities to them. How would you describe yourself? Well, determined. Determined. Uh, I mean, you have a vision. You know I what have your vision, vision is. But I do have, first of all, the greatest respect for the actors that grew up out of this period of live television. But uh, what happens when they give you a lousy actor? Must have happened. Very rarely, because really? usually I choose the actors. Ah, you do the casting. Yes. Yes. Uh. So I've been very fortunate. I've had the best actors. Okay, so I'll ask you a question, then we'll get back to work here. Right. Who's the best actor you've ever directed? <laughs> I can't say with the best. I've directed Brando, I've directed Nicholson, I've directed Gene Hackman, Paul Newman. It just goes on and on forever. Okay, so I'll ask you about, a little about each of them for a minute. Okay. okay. Dustin Hoffman. Uh, okay, let's just talk for a moment about Brando. What was that like? Because we've had many Brando stories. And he was a guy who knew his view of life also. Yeah. Well, we, we were pretty close. Were you? 
Yeah, because we did two films together. What were the films? The Chase and uh, Missouri Breaks mm. with Brando and Nicholson. My husband does not want to harm your son, but people say that... Call her. She's been told you you'll hurt Bubba if he comes back here. Who's been saying that? Everybody, on account of Jake Rogers and Anna Reeves. You know and I know and the town knows that Bubba's wife is Jake Rogers' whore. Everybody well, says everybody that... Well, everybody's wrong, Miss Reeves. I want to help your son, and I'd just give Anna an hour to go find Bubba so he could come back here and surrender. Where is he? I don't know. Calder, where is Bubba? I want to go to him. I've done so many wrong things to him. Give me a chance to go to him and help him. I can make him surrender. He won't trust that whore. I'm telling you, I don't know where he is, Mrs. Reeves. You're lying to me. Look, I can pay you. Now, this is, this is all I have now. But Monday, I'm selling the house to Briggs for $5,000, and I'll give that... Go on, Mrs. Reed. Get on home now. What's the matter? Isn't my money good enough for you? If it were Val Rogers' money, you'd take it. Well, my money is as good as his money. Go on. Val Rogers has bought you. He owns your very soul. You're going to kill Bubba to protect Jake Rogers. Shut up, you damn crazy woman. You're a murderer. Get the hell out of here. You're a murderer. You're a murderer and a liar. Brenda was easily misunderstood. He seemed to be undisciplined and not responding to the quiet orthodoxy of a movie set where there are unspoken rules. But the case with Brando was he was unable emotionally to do the same thing twice, mm. which I took as an enormous asset rather than mm. a liability. But I can see where it would drive people crazy who wanted this thing done the same way so that it would cut together with... Etc. Because that's what you're doing is this enormous jigsaw puzzle. Well, if you've got somebody who's making pieces each time that are of a different configuration and are not going to join the puzzle, or apparently are not going to join the puzzle, and the apparently is what's so important, because what you witness with Brando is, is this freedom, you know, he doesn't want to know that I've got to talk to you, Alan, like this eyeball to eyeball. And, and, and an example, I was doing a scene in Missouri Breaks. It was a scene where somebody was in, in Montana in the summertime, had been killed, and there was a funeral. And, of course, the body was on ice, being kept on ice, but there was a gathering of people. And Brando was brought in as a, an employee of these cattle owners, so we came to shoot it, and in came Brando, tapping his right cheek, just... And he, he went on with the dialogue, which was, this is what I like to eat, I can't stand okra, etc., and I'm going to do this, and I have to now go upstairs and wash my body. And he walked over to the coffin, took out a piece of ice, and put it on his <laughs> cheek and said, oh, this tooth. And he invented the toothache completely. And that's Brando, without telling us, well, the operator of the camera brought, broke his neck, but, you know, everybody was just enchanted. Now, he was a method actor. He was a method actor. And are you a method director? Yes. Okay, so can you explain yeah, that to us a little bit? Well, it, it is a free way of working, which is that earlier on I described this period in a play where the text is existent here and the actors are existent here, and that that union is is brought together. Now, certain old-time actors used to simulate certain characteristics of, of behavior. Anger was done in conventional ways. You know, romance was done in other... But what we look for in the actor is something from their personal mm. life that may be very strange. And we saw it in this generation of actors that came out of the actor's studio with Paul Newman, with Jimmy Dean, with Marlon you know, with Jack Nicholson, and those are just the guys. The women were, you know, Geraldine Page, Kim Stanley, Anne Bancroft, etc. We We were seeing something different from, from our expectation, and that was the method actor. 
whose personal material, emotional, affective material was what they used. I want to talk to you about so many things, Arthur Penn. And again, I want to just thank you so much for doing this with us. It's, oh, it's just so it's wonderful fun. for all of us. You know, I'm, I'm a 63-year-old, so I've watched all of your films at yeah. some point or another. I think of the end of Little Big Man. <laughs> I just, I still think about it all the time. You know? He goes up to the mountain to die, and then he comes down. He said, well, I guess it's not time yet. <laughs> what a moment. It was wonderful. <laughs> How did you work that out? Well, as I recall, in the book by Thomas Berger, he does die. And I was pretty much saying to Calder Willingham, who was writing the screenplay, that we had to stay with that. And Calder said, no, you can't do that, not in the film. And I resisted it until he wrote that little scene of, of, you know, this is a good day to die. And then finally, he's lying there under this sort of funeral construct pyre, you know, and then a raindrop falls on his head and he says, oh. <laughs> and <laughs> Dustin <laughs> looks at him and he says, Grandfather? Am I still in this world? Yes, Grandfather. I was afraid of that. Well, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. And he, they walked down the hill, and it, <laughs> talking about his new wife that he likes very much, except that they copulate with horses. I remember that. The tribe from which she comes. And that was the end of it. It's a great, fun film. Arthur Penn, I cannot tell you what this has meant to us. We do appreciate it, and to have you living amongst us is really quite a thing. I can brag to anybody that you know the Berkshires, and we have Arthur Penn living oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for all you've done and everything you've done for all of us, we do thank you. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>